Charlie Johnson, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, pleasure to be on here. And firstly, huge thank you to the huge impact you've had on me personally. And I know uh, millions of other people around the world. So I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, why don't we unpack you know, who you are, what you do, where are you from, and where the heck are you living now? <laughs> uh, so originally, I'm from uh, a place called Surrey, just outside of London in the UK. I currently, live, to give a short synopsis, currently live in Dubai. I have a very nice view of the marina behind me, if you, anyone's watching the video of this. Um, I, four years ago, was a real estate agent, and then from there have catapulted through launching the biggest uh, online coaching business in Europe. Um, That's what you CJ were back coaching. in the UK is real estate? Yeah, 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 for four years uh -huh. ago. I and then... Yeah, yeah, it's a small fact. That was only four years ago. That's how crazy it is. Now I live in Dubai. Yeah. So uh, I have one business, which is an online coaching business, uh, Charlie Johnson Fitness. Uh, a second business, which is Seven Figure Scaling Systems, uh, which is an online um, coaching fitness business mastermind to help online coaches scale their business. And then also another business, which is a, a call center, which is called Closing Force with a very good friend of mine. Which is yeah, a, good friend of, a, a good friend of yours that lives very close to me here in um, Mexico. Yeah, yeah so uh, so you, you and Jack have many a nice lunch together. Yeah, yeah. What a great guy. Yeah, he's uh, he's been here about seven years longer than we have, so we get a lot of insight from. Him. Now, I know why I chose Mexico for the freedom and for the weather, but why did you choose Dubai? And what do you love about it and not love about it? First, I'll start start with what I don't love about it because there's only one thing, and that's the weather in the summer. It's too hot. Yeah. June, July, August. It's like like insanely humid you can't walk outside and it's like 50 degrees wow. so that's the only drawback what i love about dubai is networking is absolutely insane and um, everyone you meet is like the best in the world or whatever they do it's like dubai is like the, the melting pot of the best people in the world and um, everything's like 20 minutes away so it's quite a big city but it's really easy to get anywhere oh that's great the weather's awesome yeah the weather's awesome uh it's super inspiring like everything here is like bigger and better so it's like they built um, a huge Ferris wheel, uh, the Dubai wheel, and they then just build the biggest one in the world. Like they built, they have the biggest shopping mall in the world here already. So they're building another one that's even bigger. Like they just think bigger. It's like within their mindset, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, our uh, mutual friend, Frank Den Blanken, turned me on to a book called The Shake CEO about the guy who yeah. kind of really built it up from not too much. It was an interesting read, that's for sure. And I was actually there in 2006. That was the the only time that I've been to Dubai, <clears throat> it rained three days when I was there, uh, but I still went to the beach in the morning and I went skiing at the mall in the afternoon. Yeah. So is, actually, is that thing my, still my, even there? Yeah. My, my, funny enough, uh, Charlie, my girlfriend, you met, she, she actually went skiing there today. So oh, this, is, this is the, like, this is where it's like La La Land, right? Because it's yeah. like, it's like Dubai's like Disneyland for adults. Like you can go skiing, you can do anything you want. You can go skiing indoors, you can go to the beach, you can, you can be whoever you want, you can do whatever you want. Um, and it's like a pure capitalism at its finest. Like you can do whatever you like here, as long as you don't um, like don't cause and do any violence, don't do anything like that, don't do any drugs, don't talk about religion, then you're good. So it's it's a, a wonderful place, very safe, and also you don't pay any tax. So from a business point of view, it's a, a strong strategic advantage in that respect. Absolutely. So going back to when you were the real estate agent now, obviously you were into fitness. Um, what got you into fitness in the first place? And then what got you to transition into the fitness industry? Uh, so originally I was very much in a sporting background. I was younger. So I, I played rugby and that got me into like weight training. Um, and I actually qualified as a personal trainer when I was about 18, 19. And I was training clients in the gym, but you know what? I just, didn't enjoy it because they weren't the right people I wanted to train. And I just felt like I was babysitting people. So sure. um, I actually came out that would became a ski instructor, another random fact for six months. Oh, uh, wow. And then, yeah. And then went into uh, the real estate industry where I was worked in for like seven, eight years. So that was a big transition. And then when I was in the real estate industry, I still continued my fitness. When I got to about 26. I really got back into it again. Mm -hmm. And I saw what was going on with social media, I started to document my own journey and then like one thing led to another. I, I was very much influenced by um, two people, Gary Vaynerchuk and Grant Cardone. So Gary Vaynerchuk oh, cool. in terms of like content yeah. and Grant Cardone in terms of sales. And that really, I used both of their approaches in terms of initially building my online business. And one thing led to another, it scaled pretty quickly. And uh, I was very fortunate to then leave my full-time job to then pursue the life of my dreams. Now you have a massive amount of transformations and social proof in your business. Like how many people have you helped make a, transition transformation 
Uh, we've worked with over, I think, 9,000 clients now in total in wow. five years. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. That's incredible. Uh, all, no. all sorts of people from all over the world. Yeah. Uh, what did you want to be as a kid? A professional football player. Ah, uh, okay. Actually, no, no, two things. A professional football player and a businessman. Sure. So I, I, I sucked at football, but okay. I, I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to... Business is a skill I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I, I'm still an infant in business, but I'm learning quickly. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, especially you'd be an infant comparing yourself to some of the people in Dubai, but uh, certainly very successful, you know, really, really helped. I mean, that's a huge impact that you've had on so many people. So you've had this business and then you and I have known each other for a couple of years. And again, through a few mutual friends, what was it that made you reach out to help for, to me for help this year in uh, particular? That's a really interesting one. And I actually think it's a similar aspect in terms of when people help reach out to me for fitness help. Cause I felt a little bit lost. Like <laughs> I obviously know what I'm doing to a certain level. Like I've gone a fairly long way compared to most people in the fitness industry, but it's to get to the next level, I don't, I didn't know what to do or what lever to pull yet. And that's where I wanted to go to someone who could give me clear guidance and to, with like a lot of experience to be like, and not just business experience, but life experience respectfully is a bit older than me um, to be like, this is what you should do next. And I think an almost like a fatherly figure in terms of like guiding me through the next steps. Whereas, and also what not to do next, because <laughs> that's that, kind of like where some of the best value comes from, because I've made so many mistakes. <laughs> Yeah, and, but that's the reality, right? Because I, I'm I'm an ideas guy. I, I have too many ideas and not enough time. A lot of them aren't are like um, women in the red dress, where they're just distracting me. Where I just need to be focused on like one, two things. And you've yeah. been very helpful in terms of realigning me in terms of like what are the big needle movies that can take me to where I want to be, and what are the things that are actually going to make me happy and fulfilled rather than just being a busy fool. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So of the many things that I've helped you with, what was like one of the first ones that had a big impact or that gave you an aha moment? Uh, I'm going to give two. One would be, this is really obvious, but I was writing goals down um, that I wanted to achieve every week in terms of like personal business goals. And one of the things you really identified to me is like a lot of these are completely out of my control. So it might be like I don't know, sign up X amount of mastermind clients. It's like, okay, that's great, but I can't directly control that or like mm -hmm. business profits, I can't directly control. And one of the things I learned from you is like um, set the goal in terms of like the tasks that you can complete to then achieve the objective overall outcome, which I think has been very helpful in terms of my overall like, mental health because I feel mm -hmm. that I am more in control of the business, if that makes sense, and myself personally. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, what was the second one? The second one was, um, it's actually bought a lot of my time back. So I know you, you like to be known as well as most productive man. So it's been, and interestingly, I know a lot of this is from the book Traction. So I read this like two years ago and I know about sure. it, like doing it in terms of like meeting cadences and stuff like that. But I'm a big believer in like the analogy is like you pay, you pay attention. Like I pay you, you tell me to do something and I execute it rather than like if I read a book, I'm like, yeah, it's a great idea, but I don't do it. Sure. And also having someone to bounce ideas off. So having like a, a weekly alignment meeting for my whole team and then breaking up our marketing meetings into, into just two short meetings a week um, and doing like goal set review meetings with like the key members of my team has just allowed me to really condense the amount of meetings I have down into a more confined period of time and then free up a lot of the rest of the week and also give the team members I have very clear, specific tasks and objectives of what they need to do that week to then move the needle because they felt like I felt pretty lost in the business in some respects. Got it. I mean, I, I feel like you're kind of like me in a way that you don't love meetings. And I know I didn't for a long time. Now, now I do once I get into them. Um, but you know, I'm an introverted person by nature. And so one, when my mentors were teaching me those meeting structures, and one one mentor in particular, Vern Harnish, he, he just said something that made it like, understand the value of the meetings is that all the problems really get solved in conversations. The more that you can talk through the problems and you can email back and forth, but it can take forever. Uh, it can be misunderstood. And so a well-designed meeting is super helpful. And we just had one right before this call where it's the sales and marketing team and our coaching team. So it's everybody. And we haven't implemented this in your business yet, but it might be something uh, that you add in. It's an additional meeting in addition to the weekly alignment and the marketing meeting where all three of those components, sales guys, coaches, 
and the marketing team get together and they share their biggest feedback from the past week about what they've learned in the conversations with clients, what they've learned from all the split tests that they've done in the marketing and what they've learned from all the calls with people. So they come on and we can talk about like, what's been the biggest objection. And so today, my friend, Rob Hanley, who spoke at the mastermind that you were at, he recently, he's not in my business, but he gave me like the question or the feedback I wanted to bring up today. And he said, he had just posted on his Instagram and said, find the biggest fear that your customer has about your offer and then guarantee against it. And so I brought that up to my team and we started down one path about how a lot of people have gotten coaches that have disappointed them. And we were kind of going down that path. And then Austin, who's our, who's one of our main copywriters said, well, that was for kind of a different program. What about for these, well, we're really working with a lot of high net worth individuals and very, very busy financial advisors and CEOs right now. And Austin said, well, what's their biggest fear? And the biggest fear for most of the sales calls is that the, the people who were signing up for our programs were skeptical that they would have time to implement our program. And so we had this 40 minute discussion of how we can you know, bring up some of our testimonials and success stories and social proof about clients who have cut 10 to 15 hours a week from a single coaching call. And that will obviously help them implement more of our coaching, but also that's what our clients want. We're actually, we, we realized that our best customer in our coaching business today doesn't necessarily want more money. They just want more time. And to, to them, time is more important than money because they, they have a lot of money. So it was a huge huge breakthrough that we had from talking it out. And so we had, we have 11 people on that meeting and everybody getting their uh, feedback in and it was huge. So we'll, we'll talk about that one after and how you can implement it for both sides of your business. But that's, that's the power of the meetings. So anything else in the meetings that has really, really helped you and you guys have some breakthroughs on? I think just having an open format for discussion and making sure I think having different departments talk to each other has been very useful. Actually having like people from the sales side, talk to the coaching side, being on the same call, mm. like a lot of great ideas get come up about that because sales will hear certain objections and then ask coaching team, is there anything you guys can provide that would help with X, Y problem? Mm. And it's again, you're not just losing anything like with blurred lines or the sort of Chinese whisper scenario. It's like yeah. people can talk directly in an open format. So I think that's been a very important uh, thing. I think just everyone being, on the same wavelength with what the the um, overall plan is. And one of the best things that I've learned from you you gave me was in terms of the structure of the meetings, to keep them very concise and to the point and how to run them. Because before I never realized what a skill it actually is to run a meeting correctly and optimally. So everyone knows what the agenda is. Everyone knows how it's going to be run. And then there's a clear structure rather than just a chat that's been going off tangent massively. So the big thing that I think I've learned is keeping it direct on task of whatever we're trying to talk about rather than letting it drift off into the abyss. Yeah. And so the, it's like the, the two A's of meetings have an agenda, a clear agenda in advance helps you people be organized, understand what it's going to be about. And then you to leave with that outcome and then alignment. That's the power of these meetings. We are aligning everybody on the same page. They understand the vision of the company because you go into a lot of companies and say, Hey, like what's the whole purpose of this company? And you might have jaded people say, well, it's just to make the guy who's the boss rich. Well, that's not the purpose of the company. The purpose of the company is go out and transform the lives of the 19,000 people that you have worked with. That's the goal of the company. And then you share these customer testimonials like, oh my, you know, then you get that jaded person in the company. Not that you had some, but, you know, you could have somebody's jaded. They're like, holy cow, we help, you know, Mary Smith lose 40 pounds and get her marriage back. I didn't realize that's what we were doing in this company. So you get everybody aligned on the, the vision, the impact you're making, and then specific goals. And then they can, when they're doing their work, they can see the value that their actions are bringing towards the company goal. But they can, and then they can also say, well, raise their hand and say, well, I'm doing this thing, but I don't understand how it aligns with, you know, trying to get up to 35,000 transformations. I'm doing this thing over here. And then you know, can have a good discussion about it and either help them see why it moves uh, you towards that or, for you to go, oh my goodness, I didn't realize, you know, you were still doing that. That was on a program we were doing six months ago. That actually needs to stop. And so it's, um, I've found from those meetings, Charlie, that some of the best ideas, and we have customer service people in our meetings, some of the best ideas in marketing 
in operations, in time savings have come from our customer service because they speak with so many people who are essentially complaining about, in most cases, you know, it's like, it's hard to access this program, or I keep on losing my password, or can you make it easier to put all the programs in one place? And, you know, when you're the owner of the business and you're just like, yeah, we'll create a new program or whatever, you don't realize that uh, aspect of it. So we get so much input from it there. So one, is, one thing uh, I'd actually add in yeah. as well, um, very quickly, that I think might be useful for anyone listening, that um, is the section of the meetings where you got me to talk about everyone's uh, personal win for the week and business win for the week, because I think it's very good, good for them people to retrospectively look over, think for themselves, okay, what did I achieve within the business this week that's going to take us forwards? Mm -hmm. That's interesting to see what everyone's response is. And also from a personal side of things, it then gets people to feel a little bit more like a family atmosphere when they're sharing what their own personal like wins are and aspirations. Absolutely. And, you know, that's where you get uh, to know one another and it just builds the the team camaraderie, which, you know, if you're, you know, if you care about somebody on the team, you're going to work a little bit harder than you are if uh, it's just another person, another number. So let's go to the productivity side of things. How much time have I saved you per week since we started working together? Just in meetings alone, I would, Yes, four to five hours. Wow. Because I was having meetings every day that could run on for an hour. Um, right. And that's that's been cut back drastically. I think everything is just a lot more efficient in that process. And I'd actually say as well, like the unquantifiable amount of like back and forth messaging that's saved by having clear meetings with everyone in terms of like what we need to talk about every week. And rather than going back and forth on Slack all the time about a million times ping ponging, it's very easy to have just a meeting like twice a week and just go through everything very precisely. Perfect. Perfect. What about in your daily routine? How much closer are we to getting you to your perfect day? Like what, what is Charlie want his day to look like? What was it like before and, and how close are we getting to getting you there? I think I'm 18 percent the way there. The only, my only challenge really is the time zone difference living in Dubai. That's the only, that's actually, that's the second downside. I'll give that. Um, but I think like it's like 90% there. It's just more fine tuning, I think, things in terms of um, my own personal structure. I know this is something I've mentioned to you before. Is And one of the personal goals I set down is to make sure I have my task written out that I have to do every morning when I first start to work. So like my favorite thing is to wake up and go straight into my computer the next day, like next morning, as soon as I get up at like 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also had a really bad habit of having Slack or WhatsApp open on my computer when I open it and I see something and it triggers me and I'm off on tangent. So that's a big thing I've worked with you to try and remove. So I make sure that that's closed uh, on my computer screens now when I turn it on so mm -hmm. that I'm not getting triggered by if we've had a good day in terms of sales or a bad day because I think what happens is you, you almost go looking for like a dopamine hit of like yeah. sales progress and it's either good or bad and that can negatively affect your thought process. Yeah, I mean, it's an addictive thing. Anything around looking at numbers, that sort of stuff, you can, you know, entrepreneurs are notorious for checking that type of stuff every single day and you just have to build the system. So my analogy that I often use, we're trying to build a fence around Charlie to protect, you know, the time wolves from coming in and stealing it and so that you can get that major stuff done first thing in the morning, which is the best time for it. What, what do you feel like before we started working together was one of the biggest time thieves in addition to all the messages that you had that were then kind of solved by the meetings? Was there anything else that you had? I think it's just a lack of clarity because I was jumping around from a lot of different tasks all the time or like I, like you, you, I talked to a friend who'd be trying a certain strategy of like, oh, maybe I should do that. And I start looking into it. And now I'm much better at being like, okay, that's great. That works for them, but that's not the plan of what I'm doing the next three months. So yeah, let's focus on what I'm doing right now, rather than getting led astray every week by the latest shiny idea of this new TikTok ad strategy or whatever it might be. Exactly. And then um, I think actually we should just pause for a second and talk about the the stuff that you're doing outside of your business so right now you you've just competed in one bodybuilding show yeah. and so how much time are you training and spending on your nutrition per week in addition to running definitely i mean i would say there are almost three full-time businesses the fitness coaching side the business coaching side and then the the sales team that you you have what are your demands outside of there and how the heck do you pull all of that together uh, so this is one, again, one of the best things about living to buy. And also something I take a huge amount of, I've learned from you over the years from following and listening to you. It's like, I delegate everything in my personal life. So Dubai is amazing for this, right? So like, <clears throat> I have a housemaid come for four hours 
hours a day. I pay her like 600 pounds a month. So I don't do anything in my house. Mm -hmm. I get all my food delivered. So I don't have to do anything. My car gets cleaned four times a week in the car park. I don't have to touch it. Um, so all I literally do is focus on my zone of genius in terms of working or working out. Uh -huh. um, in terms of the working out aspect, I train two hours in the gym four times a week. So that's eight hours. And I do 40 minutes cardio five days a week. So there's a fair amount of exercise. But what I try and do with that is be very efficient. So for example, if I'm having to do cardio in the morning for the competition, I'll be watching like educational videos to try and learn new things. Or some of the videos that you've sent me, I'll be watching. Sure. I'll be watching videos on like how to run the meetings, for example. So like I'm being as efficient as I can at the time. And even when I look at the things from the training perspective, I'll always be filming stuff on like tripods and things like that to then upload to my team to then edit for content. So I'm always trying to just be as efficient as I can with everything. And then my day is literally like time blocked, like bang, bang, bang. I know exactly what's going on. I train exactly the time, same time. I get up at the same time every day. I've got blue lights and purple lights in my house everywhere to make sure I can sleep properly. Nice. Um, I'm just trying to like be like as optimized as possible with every aspect. And I think all these little like 2% stack up on top of each other and mm -hmm. allow you to really like live a high performance life. So in terms of the competition and the challenge that it is for you, how on a scale of one to 10, how challenging is it, has it been for you to do the bodybuilding show? The it's more the mental drain towards the end of the day. I've been overdoing on stimulants and caffeine a lot because towards the end of the day, I'm like flagging a lot. So it's more yeah. my brain can't think properly sometimes. So the week up before the show was pretty bad, but it's just being like selective of what you're doing at what time, probably knowing what time you're going to be flagging. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't do any complex tasks later on in the day. And I try and just intuitively listen to my body. So even like I said to you, I messaged, I think you like yesterday or the day before being like, I'm really burnt out. I actually need to take a break at some point. So next week yeah. I'm going to take four days off, no work calls, nothing like that, just to try and reset. And I think that's just like me being an athlete and very in tune with how I feel and knowing when to put your foot on the gas and when you need to put your foot on the brake a bit. Because I think obviously you've spoken before about how you had anxiety attacks. I'm not at that point yet, yeah. but I can feel that I'm getting very jaded. And when you get jaded, you make poor decisions. And in business, the most important thing is making the right decisions. So if you're in a point where you can't think clearly, you need to rest yourself a little bit. So what would you say has been your biggest challenge in life and how did you overcome that? And how has that then helped you in business? Uh, so the biggest challenge I had in life would have been uh, in January, I had, I don't want to swear on the podcast, but I can't think of anything else other than a shit storm where uh, on the Wednesday I got divorced. I agreed to, I basically said to my wife at the time I was leaving uh and moving to dubai and she wasn't going to go and then on the thursday i had to clear out my house get rid of all my personal possessions and on the fr friday whilst i was living in a hotel five minutes before a massive podcast i was speaking on my instagram account got disabled permanently and i was like this is great fun like, i'm having like, <laughs> fun here so it's like my personal life imploded my business imploded i was like this is good. Um, well, this is and... 2019 or what year was this? No, no, no. This was this year. This was oh, this year. Wow. Yeah. Um, but it was actually one of the best things that happened to me in a very weird way because I was probably getting a bit cocky and arrogant. I felt like I could walk on water. Mm -hmm. And that whole experience humbled me so much and has made me much more defensive and thinking about playing the long game rather than being overly aggressive and... Um, just taking things for granted like i always appreciate absolutely everything a lot more now because of that and i see things in a different aspect and if something bad happens it's not going to be probably that bad whereas at that time it's like my personal life fell apart and it felt like my business was falling apart at the same time yeah. which was very challenging i actually have this little shtick that i do in some of my instagram videos or youtube videos or sometimes even on podcasts actually i did this yesterday on a podcast i said there will be days as because the person was asking me what separates you know, the really successful entrepreneur from, you know, the person who never really gets ahead. And I said, and I said, it really comes down to persistence because there will be days as an entrepreneur, when you wake up and your spouse has left you or that your spouse is angry with you, uh, your dog has run away, you've been physically punched in the stomach and then, you know, your internet doesn't work or your account gets shut down. There will be days like that where all four of those things happen. And, you know, I, I joke about it on when I say that, but, you know, now I've met a, somebody who where it kind of did happen to. And the, the thing that separates the people who are successful and the people that just never get a, to what they want 
is that when that happens to the successful person, they accept it. And then they still show up. Like I'm sure you still showed up on that podcast at a great level. And we as entrepreneurs have to show up at a level of energy, intensity, commitment that is higher than all of our team members, even on those worst days. And, you know, you could look at Elon Musk right now has probably got some of the most pressure on him of all the people in the world. And yet he's showing up with pretty good energy and intensity most days. Another person who's you know, probably going through one of the biggest challenges in their life, and I'd be interested to see how he's responding to it, is Mark Zuckerberg. He's lost $100 billion in his net worth in the last 12 months. So he was worth $140 billion. He's now worth $39 billion. Stock price of uh, Facebook or Meta or whatever it's called has just crashed. And it'd be interesting to see how he's holding up because he really only had good times all before it. But I'm sure you had some challenges along the way. But I was just curious to see, you know, how you or what you did in, in response to it. Was there anything that really helped you get through that period? Or was it just simply the persistence that you've shown through workouts and sport in the past? Um, a couple of things like as you talk about workouts, that's the only time in my life I was like, I didn't want to like I still turned up at the gym and worked out, but it was I didn't want to do it, if I'm honest. Um mm -hmm. and the first thing I did that really helped is I broke down from, say, from the business perspective, with Instagram, it shut down. I was like, okay, I, I worked out all the revenue we had from every other platform other than that one Instagram account. And I worked out how we could scrape our expenses back, like worst case scenario. And I was like, okay, we will still make money. I was like, the world is not going to end. I will be fine. And that's, I think, an important thing to really think about. Um, and then the second thing I did from that is I tried to think about it as the saying in terms of like, things don't happen to you, they happen for you. So I was like, okay, this is forcing my hand into how can I make this work without this one thing I have. And from that, actually, we had a lot of value because that really worked for us to be successful throughout the rest of this year, because I set up some sick ad strategies that were working from another Instagram account we had, which we've run for throughout the rest of the year. So everything is an opportunity and you only really maximize opportunity when your back is up against the wall and you, your hand is forced. Where anything's moving along swimmingly, you probably don't go looking for the next big thing to move you along because you've got momentum and progress. But when you have no other option, like the, the boats are burned, you have to find another way to make it work. Yeah. The, the um, success kind of makes you lazy. That brings complacency. And then that can really hurt you. And then that forces you back up against the wall. And provided that you are one of those entrepreneurs who persist, you're going to find that adversity and opportunity. So that, that was something I was actually just talking about in my Instagram earlier today. So you've had these you know, you've been running the business and you've been highly competitive in fitness. What are the success habits that kind of translate into both of those industries? So for people that are listening, they're like, I'm pretty good business, but I just can't keep my fitness going. Or people that are listening, like I'm really fit. I'm a good personal trainer, but I can't figure out the business. What can you remind them that are success habits that translate across industries or across these um, areas so that they can see that they're going to be successful in both? For me, this is why I think I've been successful with business because fitness has taught me so much and the same things you have in fitness that make you successful make you successful in business because the number one thing is structure, right? So you know what workouts you're going to be doing, you know what meals you're going to be, you know what time you're going to be doing. You apply the same thing to business in terms of having a structured day, knowing what you're supposed to be doing and when is a big head start because that's where I see a lot of people going wrong. I coach for business coaching where they're just all over the place. They've got no structure in terms of what they're supposed to be doing and they just go by the seat of the pants um, and the second thing i'd say from a fitness aspect is having like an actual specific plan in terms of like this is what i'm going to do in terms of say for nutrition or training like having a clear strategy of what you're doing and what the goals are for the next 12 months six months 12 months oh, sorry 12 weeks six months 12 months is the same thing you can do with your business because you've got to plan ahead and i think too many people don't think that way and again the, the last thing is just going to be consistency and like I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm gifted at anything, but I'm incredibly consistent and relentless. And I turn up every day. Like I post on Instagram twice, three times a day for the last like five years. I've done like mm -hmm. six, 7,000 posts. And it's that saying of like volume negates luck. If you do enough of something, eventually you will become good at it. Like yeah. as long as you keep trying with intent. And I think too many people, they try something for two weeks and then they give up and it's, they, they lack that overall consistency, which is why they, they fail at the last hurdle. Uh, what is your Instagram, by the way? So people watching this can um, go and take 
take a look at it. So if, if anyone wants to check it out, it's uh, at Charlie Johnson Fitness is my fitness account. And then the business account is seven figure scaling systems, which is a new one. So we have a lot of uh, business content on there. So that's um, Charlie Johnson Fitness and seven figure scaling systems. We have a lot of personal trainers and fitness experts, nutritionists, et cetera, who watch these videos and listen to the podcast. And they might be thinking, you know, they, they're seeing clients in real life and they might be thinking, is there really room for another fitness expert online? What, when somebody asks you that or, or uh, you know, sends you a direct message about that, what do you say to them? That there's 100 million men in the US who fit my ideal client avatar. How many people can you train? How many people do you need to make a decent living? Like hypothetically, say you charged $300 a month, which isn't that much. How many clients do you need to make a decent amount of money? If you, met, you had 100 at $300 a month, that's 30 grand a month. That's a reasonable income. That's a great income, actually. You know, 30 grand a month. Yeah. Uh, really, like, yeah, $360,000. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so, reality. Yeah. So then... I know that you coach a lot of people to do this now because I'm sure this is what happened to me when I was a, a fitness expert is I was successful selling fitness and all these people who were fitness experts said, hey, come and show me how to do this. Like Vince Del Monte and Alan Cosgrove and all these people. So when people come to you and ask you for this, what's been like, what's the first thing that you tell somebody to go and do? And then what's been one of your favorite success stories about your clients in the business side of things? Um, the one of the first things I say to people is they need to really identify how business works. So it's like you have two ways you can make more money. So number one is obviously acquiring more customers. Number two is obviously increasing the lifetime value of the customers. You either uh, you charge them more or you they stay on for longer and you charge them more frequently. So firstly, they have to understand that. And then the big thing from there, what I would do is a breakdown their program pricing, the structure and how they qualify their leads before they try and sell them. Because I think... A big mistake a lot of people make is they undercharge their programs to the demographic they sell to. And I think a lot of people, clients, say, for example, you've got a client who needs to lose 50 pounds. Selling him a 12-week program is not going to help him because he's not going to lose 50 pounds in 12 weeks. So therefore, that person, you should be looking to try and sell a 12-month program, which is then how you maximize the LTV of the client. And you also help the client get success because their end goal is not going to happen in 12 weeks. Right. Um, so that's a big thing I would suggest. And to give an example of, a client of ours who actually killed it is a, a guy called Ian Birchall from Canada and Winnipeg. Yeah, he's up uh, in Winnipeg. I, mean, I saw a video yeah, about yeah. him the other um, day. He, me and him, I hit, hit off straight away because he was hustling in a full-time job in sales. And I remember when he started, I think he was making like 4K a month. And last month he made $50,000 and he quit his full-time job. Five zero. Yeah, yeah. And he, he, yeah. So we went from 4,000 to 50,000, I think in like three and a half wow. months. And um, he sent me the nicest voice message. And I think I nearly cried because it was like, just saying how I, I'd helped him and like change his life and helped his family. And now he doesn't have to work like in a job he didn't want to do. And right. like things like that, are what gives me fulfillment. And people often ask me like, oh, what makes you happy? And it's like, I don't really seek happiness. I seek fulfillment. And things like that are what help me be fulfilled. It's like seeing people maximize the potential of what they can do. Because most people don't realize what they're capable of, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I kind of feel the same way. And I've never actually said it the way that you said it, that you don't really, like, I'm not walking around saying, oh, I really need to feel happy today, or I don't really look that happy most of the time. But I do want to feel like I've done a good job, made an impact, that something has uh, happened. And that that's the fulfillment that I'm looking for. So I like the way that you said that. And it's also amazing what you did for Ian. One other thing that you kind of touched on with the advice to the trainers is, you know, making sure that you have the right demographic. So Somebody comes to you, they have a couple thousand followers on Instagram, maybe even just a thousand followers on Instagram, and they, they train all types of people in real life, men, women, moms, dads, you know, single people, executives, and they're trying to figure out the online thing. What do you tell them when it comes to picking that best customer avatar, the demographic to go, to go after if somebody's kind of doesn't have anything set in stone? How do you get them on that right path? Because that is such an important piece of the puzzle i think uh one way to look at this would be like a way to think about is niching down to who you'd be an attractive character for for example so like i'm a 32 year old guy with abs he's quite jacked who lives in a tower in dubai marina like i'm not going to be like a housewife in texas is probably like first port of call right so it's like identify who you probably relate to the most 
And then I would probably focus on that. So like, who could you be like the superhero to? Whereas mm. for example, like successful entrepreneurs or, or young guys, um, say like 35 to 50, you want to be in great shape. Look at someone like me and be like, this guy can help me achieve what I want because I'm more relatable. Whereas someone who's a, a 45 year old mother who lives in the US or Canada probably isn't going to relate to me quite as much if that makes sense. That would be a big thing I would say. And I think sometimes people need to sometimes, like a lot of guys sometimes want to coach, uh, I don't know, 18, 20 or one year olds in terms of bodybuilding, for example. But the reality is if that's the demographic of the people you want to work with, then you have to understand you're probably not going to be able to charge them a lot because of their age. And the reality is then that your business probably isn't going to be very profitable or lucrative. So you have to think about what's the main objective here. Are you trying to create this as a, a financially profitable business or are you doing this more from passion that you want to work with young kids who, who want to do bodybuilding, for example? I, yeah, I saw that all the time when I was coaching fitness entrepreneurs is, you know, you've got the skill of both marketing and sales. You just chosen the wrong audience. They, they can't afford it and it's just not going to work. So you can, even if you were like the smartest person, best marketer in the world, you could maybe squeeze 50 or $60,000 out of this. And so therefore make that decision in your mind. Am I doing this for a larger income or am I doing this because these are the only people that I want to help? If it's the only people you want to help, great, enjoy it, understand you're not going to make a lot of money. And then if you really want to triple that income, all you have to do is just raise that demographic by about 15 years. You don't have to change almost anything else and, and you will do that. So it's, um, I'm sure that you spend a lot of time just dialing people in, but once you, once you just, actually, I use this analogy, Charlie, is I, I coach people who are formula one race cars and, you know, so they're, they're high performers. Like, you know, they're the type of person who thinks about, you know, the lights in their house to help them sleep, sleep better than they exercise and they, they want the best and they really, really have high ambitious goals, but they're kind of lost. Like you said at the start. And so they're, they're a formula one race car but their wheels are not on the track. The wheels are in the mud. You know, if you've seen a formula one race, you know, that there's, there's asphalt. And then, you know, if they spin out and they go off into the grass, they're going to spin their wheels. And that's where I come along. And all I do is I just pick up the car. Maybe I'm a crane or something and I move them and I put them down. And the next thing you know, they're still revving their engine at the same speed and the same, and their tires at the same uh, RPM. But now they're on the pavement and it gets that traction and the way they go, you know, 160, 200 miles down the road. And so that's what probably what you're doing from time to time with those entrepreneurs. And I guess that's also what you're doing with people in the fitness space is you're taking people who are probably working hard on the wrong program to get uh, get better results. I see that a lot. And I see something I actually had a conversation with someone earlier today. A lot of people who have maybe fitness businesses are making, say, ten to twenty thousand dollars a month, mm -hmm. and people are telling them to go into email marketing for to grow their business. And in my opinion, that's like a long way off what they want to be doing in terms of yeah. um, to quickly grow their business. That's something you want to be doing a lot further down the line. Yes, it's important to have an email list, but <laughs> you're not going to take a business from ten thousand dollars a month to thirty thousand dollars a month in three months by starting to do an email list you're gonna have to spend those money on ads to get an email list to grow and that's a prime example where people are like a bit like a rudderless ship they tend to go in circles because they'll start to go down the email list route and yeah. then they get no traction with it and they come back and then they try and find something else they might go into youtube for a bit and then don't get any from that and then they come back to give a good example i spoke at um mark coles you know his fitness event and uh, right. a guy mark first and spoke there he's got a million followers on youtube obviously does really really well trainers that make like 10 20k a month uh and i can tell every single person in the room then suddenly wants to do youtube because mike's doing it but youtube is the last thing that anyone in that room should really be doing right now at the level they're at for them to get it's to the next level such quickly. a slow process hmm. but also but also it's like when they hear about these things is when you hear about a marketing technique you really need to do a personality test on yourself about that marketing technique I am built for email marketing. Email marketing has made me a lot of money since I started email marketing. Actually, it didn't, it didn't start making me money until 2001. So I started email marketing in 1999 because I'm an introverted person who loves to sit in front of a computer and write. Email was built for me. I, I am blessed that I was born at the time I was born so that I was one of the first people in the fitness industry to do email marketing. Like I won the lottery. I don't buy lottery tickets because I won the lottery because email was invented. Most trainers 
are not meant for email marketing because it requires you to be sedentary for a long period of time and not talk. You look at most good personal trainers, they love to chat with people and they love to be up on their feet moving around. Email marketing is not for them because it's not a good personality fit. And then same with the YouTube aspect is that YouTube requires you to be not just an expert in your area, but to really be thinking about kind of the humor of the video, the eye-catching stuff. And again, most trainers don't think that way. They just want to teach people stuff, but that's not going to make you a YouTube star. Plus, you know, it's just going to take a long time to do it. So that's why your strategies of Instagram using Instagram is such a such a faster way of doing it and much more suited for the personal trainer. So I just want to throw like my perspective on it because it doesn't matter how good a strategy is. If you don't have the component, it's like, you know, if you took you and tried to make you into a ballerina, Charlie, like you just don't have the physical structure to be a good ballerina because you have all this muscle and it's just not going to work. But if you take you in, like you've got a rugby player physique, it would work. And so you just can't, really force things that are not going to be a good fit for you mentally and with your your habits. So that's a really good point that you bring up that people are trying to use the wrong tool from their Swiss army knife uh, in marketing and sales to, to build their business. 100%. I think also something where people just need to think about is leaning into their strengths more. So like if you're a great talker, you should probably do a podcast. If you've got a great body like Mike Thurston, for example, then doing video content is probably going to be leading to your strength rather than talking on a podcast. It's almost like that expression is like having a face for radio, like that yeah. joke. It's, yeah. it's a bit like that, right? Exactly. You got you to pick that thing that is going to give you the quick results. And, then, and that's where you see those people who have been spinning their wheels for four years all of a sudden take off because they've been, they've been working and building the habits of an entrepreneur and all that stuff and not having that success. And then all of a sudden they find that one path that just gives them the quick results. And all of a sudden people go, where did this person come from? And they were like, Hey, I was grinding it out for, you know, four years until this clicked. The last thing I want to ask you about the business coaching side of things, Charlie, is when you get a client who has a lot of self doubt or is surrounded by doubters as a lot of personal trainers are in my opinion. Um, but it kind of goes with almost any industry, but definitely in the personal training industry, how do you people that you, how do you help people get through that um, doubt that they have that they could ever really hit 20K, 30K, 40K, 50K months? It's almost like I said at the beginning of this in terms of where I had the issue with my Instagram account got disabled. I'm big into numbers. So like if you break it down to people, so one of the lead generation tactics where we crush it is on LinkedIn. So we know, for example, we make two and a half times as much per call book from LinkedIn versus Instagram. So for example, if I said to someone like, realistically someone should be able to make 12 to fifteen thousand dollars a month just from one linkedin profile mm -hmm. uh statistically what we see with our clients and we say things like look if we got you uh four or five calls a week booked um on your linkedin account do you reckon you could sell one person for a year at three thousand dollars at least and like they'll probably say yeah okay so it's like you do that over a month that's twelve thousand dollars most people are probably doing five to six thousand a month at the moment already from instagram you chuck in another lead generation strategy like LinkedIn and then straight away they're already at the $20,000. So That's as amazing. soon as you break things down into like a really clear, the numbers and into the metrics in terms of like even like how many messages you'd have to do per day to book a call, mm -hmm. it then makes it really clear for people. And I think that's the big thing in terms of just breaking things down into small bite-sized chunks, because I think the big problem, and I know you see this all the time is that people get overwhelmed because they think it's too much and they can't necessarily do it. Whereas if you just say some, look, and this is how I coach people. It's like, just do these one to two things. Don't do anything else. Just these one to two things. And then we'll go to the next thing. And I literally will say to them, like, don't come back until these are done. Because if you book in another call and you haven't done these two things, I'm just going to tell you to do these two things again, because this is what you need to do right now. I remember, um, well, first of all, you're right. And keeping it simple is very important. And it goes back to what you were talking about before with the people chasing the YouTube, like, they give up on things too soon and they chase the other thing and then they give up on that thing too soon and so on and so forth. But you got to choose the right thing and just do that stuff. And, but our friend Frank said, you know, he helped you a lot at the beginning, I think. Yeah. And he, he, Frank said to me, you know, Charlie's so successful because I would tell him, I would give him a month's worth of work and we'd be back on the phone the next week and he'd have everything done. And so 
he was always uh, speaking so highly of you and, and seeing your praises. And that's why, you know, I was super excited uh, to hear from you and, and be able to help you out. So now last thing, Charlie, what's the big vision for Charlie Johnson fitness and seven figure scaling systems? The goal for Charlie Johnson fitness. So we want to transform over a hundred thousand clients by 2030. Um, so we've got a bit of a way to go. We've got what's that, six years, six and a half years, just six years. Um, and for seven figure scaling systems, the goal is to scale that up. We want to get to around 150 mastermind members. And we want to initially get 75 people to over seven figures a year within the next 18 months. So that's the big goal is to try and really help projectually push up a lot of people in the fitness industry. Cause there's a lot of people who aren't maximizing what they can do right now. And like, mm-hmm. One of my favorite things is like, I think that's from a fitness aspect is like, I don't want average results. I want to maximize results with everything. Can you mention in terms of me executing things very quickly? It's almost where I find out something that I should have done before. And I feel bad that I haven't already done it. So I have to implement it as quickly as possible to feel like I'm, I'm not missing out anymore. And I think that's where people, like, this is one of your sayings, what success loves speed. And I think about that all the time since you said that to me. And it's like the quicker you do something, Got it on the, hat. the longer, yeah, there you go. The longer you have that compound effect of that winning for you. So it's like, as soon as I find out anything I should be doing, it's like we need to implement this right now, and not procrastinate. Like I had a coaching call with someone the other day, one of my clients. He was like, "Oh, yeah, yeah I, I, like his business is struggling a bit." And I was like, "You need to do this. You need to do this on LinkedIn." He's like, "Yeah, I'll do it in January." I was like, "We're in October." I was like, "What? What on earth is wrong with you?" It's like, yeah. "Do this right now. Next week, book two to three hours out and do this." And that's what sometimes just people need a bit of a kick in the backside because they're just kicking the can down the road. They don't want to do the work. Yeah, exactly. Um, so your Instagram is at Charlie Johnson Fitness for the fitness side of things. So, so anybody listening, you're busy, you want to gain muscle, lose fat, you can go and message Charlie on there and they'll get you set up with the right program. And then if somebody is a coach, trainer, nutritionist who wants to go and help more people and have more impact They go to seven figure scaling systems on Instagram. Is there any other way that people should reach out and, or uh, do you have podcasts um, or anything else? Yeah. I would also suggest checking out uh, the podcast. We have the shredded shows. We've got some huge guests on there. We've got an episode with Craig from a little while ago as well. Uh, I think we're over 330 episodes on there. So we've had some huge guests in the fitness industry. Where, uh, so obviously iTunes for the shredded uh, show, uh, but iTunes, any- Spotify, YouTube, uh, it's all on there. I've got a YouTube channel as well, Charlie Johnson Fitness. Very easy to find. TikTok as well. If you put my Charlie Johnson Fitness in anywhere, it'll pretty much come up on every platform. Fantastic. Fantastic. Last question for you, Charlie. What is your favorite Craig Ballantyne book and why? Oh, um, The Perfect Day Formula, because I think it's most important about trying to win each individual day. And if you win each individual day, you then win the week. And I'm a big fan in terms of like, from my fitness side of things having the day very structured like i said earlier on in terms of like literally i'll get up at five every day i work till 6 15 at the moment i'll do cardio for an hour i'll eat do small work train at 8 30 be home again at 11 30 eat um and then bang 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 the rest of the day goes so i think it's structure will give you freedom and success and that's the big thing i took from that book absolutely awesome my man well super excited when's your next show when's the last one uh 13th of november in bucharest in romania and i can't wait because then i can actually eat and i hopefully can function more like a normal human and life becomes easy if you can run a business and you're in the middle of a contest prep life is then super easy afterwards so i'm very much looking yeah i'm i mean if you're able to do all of this with all the the time crunch and stuff i can't wait until you know, things are freed up a little bit more. Why did you choose Roma- Why Romania? What's particular um, about I was that supposed show? To be into J- I was supposed to go into Japan. Oh. Um, but they've got some like COVID issues and stuff there. So I was like, it. it's easy just to go to Romania. Perfect. Uh, awesome, man. Well, good luck with that. And looking forward to uh, every day getting a WhatsApp message from you and yeah. helping you dial Pleasure. into business and, and our Thank next you. coaching call. Thanks, my man.